Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Bordering on the paranormal, the phenomenon of alien abduction has polarized the world in opinions and conclusions. The truth of whether or not extraterrestrials are somehow finding their way to our planet to perform strange experiments on hapless victims is possibly secondary to the mystery of the widespread accounts of such visitations. How can so many people have had encounters and yet there is little concrete evidence? Linda Cortile claimed that gray aliens abducted her from her apartment in Manhattan. As is the case with all abduction stories, skeptics have labeled hers a hoax. Believers, however, have dubbed it the Manhattan Transfer Abduction. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode, I'll share a heartbreaking story of love gone wrong. It's a tale of passion, betrayal, murder, and the electric chair. A man keeps seeing shadowy figures in his peripheral vision. They say the widow's ghost lingers in the tower of the Drish house and sets the house ablaze with phantom fire. It is said that some hundred years ago, people in Jamaica believed in the powers of so-called shadow killers. But who or what were they? 15 acres of land purchased by the city of Long Beach, California in 1976 is what comprises a place known as DeForest Park. By day, it is filled with sun, sand, and fun. By night, it is filled with shudders, scares, and screams. Friends were planning for a good time of dirt biking, hunting, and drinking beer. They should never have visited the cemetery. Two women walking home in the twilight come across the ghost of a woman dead for the past year. A man tells the terrifying story of how he was possessed by a demon. Two girls discover that even if you don't believe a legend of ghostly children, you still shouldn't tease them. If you vacation at Carlsbad Lagoon, you'll need something stronger than sunscreen to protect you. Traumatic events can sometimes trigger poltergeist activity, but for one young girl, the torment seemed to have no end. The hills of northern Chile are not safe for men walking alone at night. A female spirit known as La Lola stalks the night, lost and enraged over the murder of her husband. Glowing eyes in the dark, a man in a dark suit, and a party in the other room, none of which are real except to two young girls who swear it actually happened. Lehigh, Oklahoma, with the dark past of gangsters, the Ku Klux Klan, and corrupt sheriff, and the paranormal. But first, the terrifying true story of the abduction of Linda Cortile. Was she truly abducted by aliens, or is there another explanation? We begin with that story. Now, Bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. During his lifetime, Bud Elliott Hopkins became one of the world's foremost UFO investigators. Rather than investigate close encounters, he opted to discover more about the growing reports of alien abductions. 
Hopkins poured so much of his curiosity into researching the phenomenon that he acquired the nickname the Father of the Abduction Movement. He wrote a pair of books on the subject, the second of which led to a third. In April 1989, 41-year-old Linda Cortile was curious about the second of these books, Intruders, the Incredible Visitations of Copley Woods, and she began to read it. The more she read, the more she began putting two and two together. Thirteen years previously, she discovered a bump on her face not far from her nose. When a doctor examined this bump, he told her it was nothing more than a surgery. The only problem with this hypothesis was that no surgery had taken place. Seven months after she initially met Bud Hopkins, Linda became the center of what many people cited as the most compelling and controversial of all alien abduction cases. They called the case the Manhattan Transfer Abduction. She originally called herself Linda Cortile, but she later changed her name to Linda Napolitano. Around 3 a.m. on November 30, 1989, Linda supposedly had an experience with several gray aliens. At the time, she could only recall fragments, but she remembered enough to claim that she floated out of her closed bedroom window on her 12th floor apartment into a hovering UFO. Once on board, the beings escorted her to a room that was likely a medical bay. There, she underwent an examination. With selected parts of the event not immediately available to her, Hopkins decided to try hypnotic regression. These sessions took place over the course of much of the following year. Along with her original memories, these sessions filled in many blanks of a standard abduction experience. What makes the Manhattan Transfer Abduction experience stand out from almost every other one was what happened just over a year after the abduction. Hopkins received apparent confirmation from two additional witnesses. A letter arrived in the post from two men called Richard and Dan. Even though the letter corroborated the reports Linda made, Hopkins did have some doubts over the pair. Wanting to know more about them, Hopkins conducted background checks on them. It turned out both men had the same career – close quarters bodyguards. Additionally, on November 30th, both men were guarding the same man. Some people believe that man was the current United Nations Secretary General, Javier Perez de Cuolar. The three of them were in a limousine and were crossing the Brooklyn Bridge when they saw something that shocked them. Both bodyguards insisted that they saw a woman floating way above the ground towards a massive craft hovering nearby. If that wasn't enough of a sight, a trio of other beings was accompanying the woman. When the four entered the craft, it headed for the East River and disappeared underwater. Whatever took place in the middle of that November night had a profound effect on Linda and even more so on the bodyguards. Both men became irrational and began to display psychotic behavior. Dan convinced himself that Linda had an unusual supernatural power or an extraordinary influence on other people. Dan's borderline obsession with Linda took on a much more serious threat when he began stalking her. Things took on a strange turn on April 29, 1991, when both men inflicted a more down-to-earth abduction of Linda. They bundled her into their vehicle and interrogated her for several hours. All of this took place in broad daylight. It was Dan who took on the role of the so-called bad cop. At no time did he accept Linda's denials about the original abduction experience. The more protests she uttered, the more upset Dan became. Six months after the second abduction, Linda suffered a third. Dan brought Linda to a safe house in Long Island and forced her to put on a nightgown, similar to the one she wore when they saw her floating away from her apartment. Richard was nowhere to be seen, but Linda did recall that she spotted some official paperwork from the CIA. Linda did manage to escape the house, but the foot chase ended when Dan caught up with her on a beach. Dan dunked her head into the sea more than once before Richard turned up and coaxed Dan into releasing her. 
Richard took Linda home. A month later, Richard turned up at her door. He told her that Dan's obsessive behavior had become so out of control that he was actually committed to an asylum. While all of this was taking place, Bud Hopkins received another letter in the mail. This came from a woman called Janet Trimble. She revealed that she, too, was driving across the Brooklyn Bridge at the time of the original abduction. Trimble, a retired telephone operator, assumed that the event was nothing more than a scene or filming of a scene from an upcoming science fiction film. With the addition of a fourth witness, Hopkins made the decision to go public with some of the details of the whole event. If Coelar had come forward publicly, he could have propelled the quartile abduction into the stratosphere of UFO cases with credible documentation. Hopkins and Coelar corresponded on a regular basis, and while he did confirm details, Coelar refused to go public. Coelar was willing to meet with Hopkins behind closed doors on the condition that Hopkins never disclose his name to the public domain. In 2003, Linda Cortile agreed to a sit-down interview with French magazine La Gazette Fortena. During this interview, she added several new facts to her account. The main addition to the original report was information of an undisclosed witness to the abduction. All that Cortile revealed was that the witness was a truck driver for the New York Post and had an ideal vantage point from the Brooklyn Bridge. Today, the Linda Cortile case website claims there are 23 witnesses of the Manhattan transfer abduction case on public record. Skeptics provide many loopholes to the story of Linda Napolitano and argue that many details of the case could be too good to be true. The apartment block that Cortile lived in was a stone's throw from the active loading dock of the New York Post. None of the workers on duty that shift reported anything unusual at the time that could be due to their own schedule at the time in question. A more telling fact that counts against this abduction could surround Kualler and his limousine. Security personnel insists that transporting a dignitary such as the Secretary General of the UN is an enormous logistical process. Security teams often prepare high-ranking officials travel well in advance. A huge part of this is the timetables given. If the car that is transporting the Secretary General is even a few seconds behind schedule, the UN forces would have to move in and determine what, if any, action is required. Checkpoints are also set up and used to help determine whether or not lateness is an issue. It has been almost three decades, and the Manhattan transfer abduction is still causing a stir. What really happened to Linda Cortile, if anything, is a debatable mystery. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. In Tuscaloosa, Alabama, stands the restored Drish House, a stately home that now holds a spot on the National Register of Historic Places. However, the Drish House has not always been a priority for preservation. In fact, the Drish House has changed hands many times since the tragic deaths of its original owners, and some think this has to do with tales of its haunting. Built over the course of two years starting in 1837, the Drish House belonged to slave owner John Drish and his wife Sarah. The marriage was a second for both of them, 
Their first spouses had both died, and Sarah's husband had left her quite wealthy. Drish's slaves were instrumental in the building of the new home, and much of its rich architecture can be attributed to their work. In 1867, tragedy struck. Drish, an alleged alcoholic, was said to be sobering up after a night of drinking when he got the shakes and, in a hallucinatory state, ran across a hallway and threw himself from the upstairs balcony, killing himself upon impact at the bottom of the stairs. Sarah, now a widow twice over, was devastated. Drish had left elaborate burial requests for his funeral, and she ensured that these were carried out to the letter. After his death, however, the widow became obsessed with her grief. Sarah insisted that when she died, she was to have the exact treatment as her husband. She even saved the candles that had been used at his wake so that they might burn at her funeral. Yet when Sarah did die in 1884, she had hidden the candles so well that no one could find them and honor her dying wish. Many see this failure to carry out a mournful woman's final request as the spark that ignited the Drish House hauntings. Not long after Sarah's death, a local was alarmed to discover a fire burning in the front tower of the home. An emergency call was made, yet when responders arrived, no fire was burning. These phantom fire sightings happened repeatedly. Some surmised that it was Sarah's spirit lingering in the tower that set the space ablaze, angered or disappointed that her husband's candles had not been burned at her own funeral. The house changed ownership multiple times in the ensuing years. The building was used as apartments during Tuscaloosa's population expansion, as a school owned by the Tuscaloosa Board of Education, as a wrecking company, and as a church, during which time an adjacent structure was built to house various Sunday school classes. These transitions brought the house into the late 20th century. When the church finally closed in 1995 for financial reasons, the old Drish house slipped into abandonment and was eventually condemned by the city. That all changed by the new millennium. First, the Tuscaloosa County Preservation Society took over the Drish house, conducting initial repairs before selling it to a private owner. In 2008, after the house was fixed to the point of safety, a team of paranormal investigators was allowed inside to examine the alleged paranormal activity. While there were no major breakthroughs, the team did capture some anomalous activity and were bolstered by the fact that they had finally gained access to the Drish house after years of being off-limits. By 2015, news broke that the Drish house was coming back to life. By 2016, the new owner had restored the estate and opened it up to the public as a historical and cultural place of interest. You can now host a corporate event, a party, or, if you and your partner are history diehards with a taste for the paranormal, a wedding. Just remember, if you do decide to step inside Tuscaloosa's Drish house, keep a watchful eye on its tower. Sarah's troubled spirit may linger in the window. Fifteen acres of land purchased by the city of Long Beach, California in 1976 is what comprises a place known as the Forest Park. Here you can hike a nature trail, let the kiddos play on playground equipment or engage in any one of a number of interesting sports for which they have the requisite courts – basketball, volleyball, tennis, the list goes on and on. And if you go towards the end of the day, and especially if you happen to go alone, you might just get the fright of your life. There's nothing uncommon about feeling that someone is following you, especially when you're in a dark and seemingly dangerous place and the protective sun has gone down for the night. But here, at least, according to many of the Long Beach locals, that feeling is all too justified. Sudden gusts of cold air, voices on the wind, and that awful prickly feeling at the back of your neck. 
something that signals to your brain that someone or something is taking far too much of an interest in you and probably wants to see you dead or worse, perhaps even threatening to invade your thoughts and dreams. These are all precursors to the appearance of a paranormal creature which some say inhabits the grim darkness of DeForest Park at night, a park which some locals feel is one of the most haunted places in Long Beach. I saw it a couple of times back when I was a lot younger, faster and braver, or possibly more stupid, says Robert B., who works as an online medium, telling us he's employed at one of the best psychic networks around. At 55, while no spring chicken is still hale and healthy enough to go mountain biking every weekend, but will not go near the park. I say it, but what I really think is that it was a she, and she is a ghoul of some sort, perhaps a crossover between a ghost and some sort of damn zombie, he says. He looks at me as if to say he knows that this sounds ridiculous, so I assure him it doesn't. I've heard this kind of thing before. The first time I saw her, she didn't seem to see me, but the second time she chased me halfway through the park. I'm telling you, I was 23 or 24 when that happened and in the prime of my life. I was just looking for something to do on the weekend, but I thought by the time that I got out of that godforsaken park, I was going to have a heart attack and kneel over right there. I got a good look at her, you see, he continued, and his face screws up in horror and revulsion at the memory. It looked like all of her skin had sloughed off from her face, which sagged down so that it partially covered her eyeballs, to the way that the skin of her fingers seemed stretchy over the bones, like she was wearing a pair of surgical gloves, only it was her skin. Her clothes are filthy, just rags really, and she walks through the trees with this weird sideways gait, like her entire lower half has been ratcheted sideways by something. I suppose it has. Whatever she is, whatever she used to be before she became this thing, I can tell you this, she died a horrible death. I was in my second year of university studying law. Most of my friends were from farms, and we spent quite a lot of weekends and holidays on the different farms. The summer of 2005, one of my friends, Charles, invited me and another friend, Rudy, over to his farm for the December holidays as his parents went to the coast to visit relatives. The farm was a beautiful but typical South African Great Karoo farmstead dating from before 1900. The farm was about 75 kilometers or 47 miles from the nearest town and about 15 kilometers or 9 miles from the nearest main road, which itself was not paved or traveled frequently. We were looking forward to a good week or two of dirt biking, hunting, and drinking beer. We were there for two days when Charles' brother, his brother's girlfriend, and a female friend came to visit. At around 1 in the morning, Charles' brother remarked, that the time was right for the farmstead's ghost to be active and that we should go see if it was around the cemetery. We laughed as ghost stories are a common scare tactic on remote farms in the area. Still, we decided to go. Charles' brother led everyone to the wooded area at the back of the house and opened a rusty gate which made a high-pitched squeaky noise. To be honest, that sound changed the mood of the party as we were about 50 meters or 164 feet from the old graveyard. As we got a view of the graves, we all stopped dead in our tracks, no pun intended. There was the ghost, sitting on a grave about 10 meters from us. It's difficult to describe, but the ghost looked like a solid and very bright white one-dimensional humanoid figure in a sitting position. It was so bright we could barely see the trees through it. There was no light source nearby. We didn't even have a single torch or cell phone with us. Then the ghost started to move. It slowly stood upright and started to pace the graveyard. A feeling of dread overcame us. The only thing that convinced me the ghost wasn't a hoax was the way it moved. It seemed like there was some type of lag in its movement. 
Gamers will understand what I'm talking about. It would take one slow step, freeze for a moment, then instantly appear a few feet ahead, repeating the process. We watched it pace for a minute, then it turned and sat back on the grave. It was at that moment that we left, quickly but quietly. We went back to the house and had a few cups of coffee to reflect on everything and get our nerves back together. Charles and his brother tried to convince us that what we had seen was real as the rest of us started to have doubts. We all decided to return to have a second look, though in the back of our minds we knew that it could not be a practical joke as there was no one else around for at least 20 kilometers or 12 miles. As we approached, we saw the ghost still sitting on its grave. One of the girls whispered something and we could see whatever it was turn its head towards us. It then stood up in a smooth motion and started walking towards us in its characteristically weird manner. Previously, the ghost had been quiet, but now we could hear its movement over the dead leaves. We all froze in shock until it was about two meters from us. Suddenly, we heard the sound of something bipedal sprinting towards us from the right. However, nothing was visible under the moonlight. That was the moment all of us hauled tail back to the farmstead. Everyone was a bit shaken up after this experience, and we stood around the kitchen for a while, this time drinking something stronger than coffee. We decided to call it a night, and everyone went their separate ways to their rooms. The next day, Rudy and I got up before everyone else and decided to check out the cemetery. Everything looked familiar in the daylight, and we noticed no footprints around the fence, aside from our own made the night before. The inside of the fenced-off cemetery was untouched. There were no prints, no drag marks, nothing. That evening, Charles' brother, his girlfriend, and the female friend left, leaving only me, Charles, and Rudy behind. We had a braai and a few more beers, and around midnight, Rudy and I decided to head back to the cemetery. We left the lounge and walked through the kitchen to the back door. As I laid my hand on the door handle, my car's alarm went off. Charles flipped on the outside floodlights and ran back to the house to fetch a shotgun as he thought there was an intruder messing with the cars. My car alarm wasn't sensitive and never went off unless someone messed with it. We looked outside but saw no fresh footprints. Guessing that an insect had somehow entered the car and triggered the alarm, we went back to the house to lock up the shotgun, then head to the cemetery. Literally, when I touched the door handle, the alarm went off for the second time. I still had my keys and remote in my pocket and quickly shut off the alarm through the window. Needless to say, we laid off our plans to visit the graveyard that night, and my car's alarm was quiet from then on. We enjoyed the rest of our visit, but I must admit that it was hard to sleep the last few nights. Was it a well-played hoax? I guess we'll never know, as my friend insists to this day that it wasn't. The farm is a bit far from where I stay now, but I do plan to visit sometime in the future. This time, however, I will take a camcorder and maybe a voice recorder. About a year ago, I began getting tons of notifications about how somebody was trying to log into my social media. I was getting email phishing scams on a daily basis. I was being inundated with email sales pitches from companies I'd never even heard of. I was getting calls and texts from those same companies. I was listening to a podcast that talked about Incogni, short for incognito, and I thought I'd give it a try. For the past year, Incogni has reduced the number of email and spam calls and texts that I receive, it's helped to protect my identity from hackers, and helps keep my data safe. 
Over the past year, Incogni has successfully removed my personal information from over 200 different data brokerage sites, and I get regular updates on how many are still in progress, how many have been successfully completed, and how many requests were sent out to remove my personal information. It would have taken me over 160 hours to do all of this, and nobody has time or patience for that. Fortunately, it's all taken care of by Incogni. I live online, personally and professionally, and I trust Incogni to help me live with a lot less worry. You can give Incogni a try right now by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. That's short for Incognito. I-N-C-O-G-N-I. WeirdDarkness.com slash Incogni. It is said that some hundred years ago, people in Jamaica believed the powers of so-called shadow killers. These were witches, wizards who spread terror by practicing black magic. Is there any truth behind these stories, or are we simply dealing with superstition? Do some modern people really still believe in the power of spells and black magic? Are there any interesting historical accounts and ancient history facts that could help us shed more light on the mysterious shadow killers. Why is the practice of obeya forbidden? The so-called shadow killers were men and women who became known as obeya. The term obeya is first encountered in documents from the early 18th century, and the history of obeya is similar to that of voodoo in Haiti and Santeria in Latin America. African slaves brought spiritual practices to the Caribbean that included folk healing and belief in magic. It is from these arrivals and their spiritualisms that Obeya originates. Obeya is perhaps the oldest of all Afro-Creole religions in the Caribbean. Its name is derived from the Ashanti words Obey Ifo or Obeya, meaning wizard or witch. According to Marguerite Fernandez Omos and Lisbeth Paravacini Gerpe, author of the book Creole Religions of the Caribbean, an introduction of voodoo and santeria to Obeya and Espiritismo, Obeya is not a religion so much as a system of beliefs rooted in Creole notions of spirituality, which acknowledges the existence and power of the supernatural world. Jamaica is a highly religious country. Christianity dominates nearly every aspect of life and according to the church, the practice of obeya is associated with evil. Until recently, the practice of obeya was punishable by flogging or imprisonment, among other penalties. But how did the obeya followers become known as shadow killers? Stories tell that obeya men and women used to practice black magic in secret. They undertook assignments on behalf of others to deliberately hurt another person. What made many people especially afraid of the Obeya were the rumors that they could kill people by capturing their shadow. These rumors are most likely the result of a conflict between Mayal and Obeya. Mayal is a variation of Obeya that is practiced in Jamaica. The Mayal men position themselves as the good opponents to evil Obeya. They claim that Obeya men stole people's shadows and they set themselves up as the helpers of those who wished to have their shadows restored. After 1760, it became punishable by death for slaves to practice obeya in Jamaica, and the rest of the British colonies followed suit. The story can be traced to the Tacky Rebellions in 1760, when a man named Tacky led a revolt by Coromantine slaves. It was said that he gave the slaves a magical preparation that was supposed to render them invulnerable to the weapons of the authorities. The passage of the law was meant to safeguard against the practice of obeya, which the colonizers thought could possibly lead to further revolts. In court documents from 1760, it is written that obeya practitioners used blood, feathers, teeth from dogs and alligators, broken bottles, snakes, roosters, soil, eggs, and eggshells for evil, magical purposes. In 1824, there were about 150 Obeya men and women throughout Jamaica, but the numbers have not been officially confirmed. Obeya men and women were feared, but also popular, at least to some extent, 
and they played an important role in the lives of slaves who had no human rights. Slaves who had been mistreated turned to the Obeah to seek justice and revenge. Obeah was considered bad magic, but for many people, it seemed to empower them to shape their own existence by manipulating the spirits, both benevolent and malevolent. It should be added that most people in Jamaica, both free as well as slaves, distanced themselves from the Obeah people. Practicing Obeya resulted in expulsion of the social community. The situation was different on other islands, such as, for example, Barbados and Leeward Islands, where Obeya were admired and held a high status. Practice of Obeya is forbidden in Jamaica, but there are still those who refuse to give up their beliefs in the power of magic. Although a few people believe in Obeya in the cities, there are some modern Obeya men and women who say they can help with all manner of things, from curing illness to removing curses. Over the years, the popularity of Obeya has waned, and finding Obeya men and women to reveal what they do is rare. People who use Obeya services rarely want to talk openly about it, and it looks as if the old Obeya traditions are slowly fading away. I was up late, working on my computer. I'm a 39-year-old male, and I've always thought I saw shadow figures out of my peripheral vision, but I always assumed it was my eyes playing tricks on me. Until a couple of months ago. I moved into a new home about two years ago. The shadow figures were quite active in my peripheral, especially in my kitchen. As a matter of fact, only in my kitchen and never at night. I never realized that until now. Anyway, I still assumed it was just peripheral until I was up late, about 2 a.m., getting some work done on my computer. Forty-five minutes or so had gone by. I wasn't sleepy or tired, nor did my eyes burn from the computer screen. I saw her out of the corner of my eye, sitting on my printer, swinging her feet. She had on a hooded cloak. I didn't immediately turn, thinking she would disappear because I thought my eyes again were playing tricks on me. I couldn't see any definition or glowing eyes or anything, just a silhouette of a little girl or woman or whatever it was, but I'm sure it was female. Before turning to look at her, while her feet were swinging next to me, oh yes, my printer is about a foot from my computer, I said, I see you. She didn't move or stop swinging her feet until I tried to look directly at her. I looked directly at her hood, where her face would be. She stopped swinging her feet, but she did not disappear promptly. She stayed visual for about eight seconds, and we were just looking at each other. I started to get upset because I'm a very private person. I immediately got up and turned on the light. She was already gone, though, so I thought. I was extremely upset. It took me about 15 minutes, two cold glasses of water, and a sit-down on my bed. So I started back working on my computer with the light on now. About 10 minutes in, the feet were swinging again out of my peripheral. I said, what do you want? Not looking at her this time, because now I'm freaked out. As I said that, another hooded cloaked figure was moving on my right side. I immediately turned to look at it and it was directly on my shoulder like it was either reading what I was typing or staring at me. I wanted to say I could feel it breathing on my shoulder like a temperature change, but I'm not 100% sure about that because they both disappeared when I looked at it. They were playing with me that night because I immediately saved my work, turned my computer off, left the light on, and turned on the TV. I watched a comedy to laugh and changed my mind. How I figured they were playing, because about an hour later, when I got up to go and get a snack in that same area where the second figure was on my shoulder, it was running next to me outside of my room. I haven't seen them again, but I never felt threatened or in harm's way while they were here. It felt like they were either amused by me, 
wanted to really know if I could see them or maybe studying me. I have no clue, but it still freaks me out until this day. I also stopped seeing the quick, shadowy swooshes behind me in my peripheral in the kitchen after that night. Maybe they were saying goodbye or something. I really want to know what in the world or out of this world these entities are and what they want. They're always maybe about three feet or so tall, about the height of an average seven-year-old. The Snyder murder, as one crime writer put it, was a cheap crime involving cheap people. Many considered it the low point in the history of the early 1900s, but for those who lived in the thrill-hungry days of the Roaring Twenties, they devoured every sordid detail and made the otherwise mundane Ruth Snyder and her accomplice Judd Gray into famous celebrities. In addition to murder, their second greatest crime was simply being stupid. The events in the case began quietly in 1925 when Ruth Brown Snyder, a discontented Long Island housewife, met a corset salesman named Henry Judd Gray while having lunch in New York. Ruth, 32, was a tall blonde with solid good looks and a commanding personality. Judd Gray, 34, was short and almost instantly forgettable. He had a cleft chin and thick glasses that gave him a perpetual look of surprise. Despite the fact that they seemed to be polar opposites, sexual attraction flared between the two of them at their first meeting, and they soon began a torrid affair. Ruth Snyder's husband, Albert, was the art editor of the magazine Motorboating – no laughing – and was never home during the day. The adulterous couple only had the Snyder's nine-year-old daughter Lorraine to contend with, and the amorous pair would often meet at the Snyder's home while Lorraine was at school. On other occasions, the little girl would be left in a hotel lobby while her mother and her lover met upstairs. They met as often as possible and seemed unable to get enough of one another. But Ruth Snyder soon changed from a sex-obsessed housewife to a woman with devious plans. Bored in her loveless marriage, she tried to convince Judd that her husband mistreated her and that he must be killed. Gray objected, but Ruth continued to pester him with hints, suggestions, and then outright demands. Finally, on Saturday, March 19, 1927, Judd gave in. It was a cold, raw day on Long Island and Gray spent most of the day drinking, trying to summon the courage to go through with the murder. He and Ruth had cooked up a plan that had him traveling by train to New York from Syracuse and then by bus to Long Island. When he arrived in Queens Village, where the Snyders lived, he walked around for an hour, stopping under streetlights to take drinks from his flask. It was almost as if he hoped to be spotted and arrested for breaking the law no one paid any attention to him, though, and finally he had to enter the Snyder home. He came in through the back door, as he and Ruth had planned. The Snyder family was away at a party and would return late. Judd had promised to hide in a spare room where Ruth had left a window sash weight, rubber gloves, and chloroform, all the tools of murder. Ruth returned home around 2 a.m., and she opened the bedroom door a crack. She whispered, "'Are you in there, bud, dear?' She soon returned, wearing only a slip, and the two had sex with their husband asleep just down the hallway. Finally, after about an hour, Gray grabbed the window sash weight, and Ruth led him to the master bedroom, where Albert Snyder slept with the blankets up over his head. The two of them stood on opposite sides of the bed, and then Gray raised the sash weight and brought it down clumsily onto Snyder's head. The weak blow merely glanced off the man's skull, and while stunned, he let out a roar and tried to seize his attacker. Judd became terrified and let out a whining scream for help. There was no panic in Ruth Snyder, and with a snort of disgust and anger, she grabbed the weight 
from Judd's hands and crashed it down on her husband's skull, killing him. After that, the two of them went downstairs, had drinks, and chatted about the rest of their plan. They faked a robbery by knocking over some chairs and loosely tying Ruth's hands and feet. Minutes after Gray left, Ruth began banging on Lorraine's door. The child ran out and removed the gag from her mother's mouth. She told her daughter to get help, and Lorraine ran next door to the neighbor's house, where the police were called. Even though the pair believed they had planned well, their robbery was far from convincing to experienced police officers. All of the items that Ruth said had been taken by the mysterious burglar were found hidden in the house and detectives began to question her. Surprisingly, she gave up almost at once and confessed to the murder. Not surprisingly, she blamed everything on Judd Gray. He was found hours later, hiding in his Syracuse hotel room. He shrieked his innocence and insisted that he had not been in New York. When confronted with the train ticket stub that he had carelessly tossed in the trash can of the hotel room, he broke down and confessed. Like Ruth, he blamed everything on his accomplice. Damon Runyon, the celebrated newsman, later wrote that Ruth and Judd were inept idiots and called the whole mess the dumbbell murder because it was so dumb. By the time the case went to trial, the two former lovers were at one another's throats, each blaming the other for the deadly deed. The trial became a media frenzy. Celebrities attended in droves, including mystery writer Mary Roberts Reinhardt, director D.W. Griffith, author Will Durant, evangelists Billy Sunday and Amy Semple McPherson, and many others. Both defendants had separate attorneys arguing for their innocence. Ruth's lawyer stated that her husband drove love out from the house by longing after a departed sweetheart, leaving her no choice but to have an affair. Judd, she claimed, took her to speakeasies and drank himself senseless, but she never touched a drop of liquor. When Judd took the stand, his lawyer blamed Ruth for everything and described his client's situation as the most tragic story that has ever gripped the human heart. Just as Ruth had blamed everything on him, he told the jury that she had forced him to kill her husband. The jury didn't care, and in just 98 minutes found them both guilty and sentenced to die in the electric chair. Judd Gray was executed first on January 12, 1928. He sat smiling in his cell when the warden came for him. He told the warden that he was ready to go. He said, I have nothing to fear. Ruth Snyder followed her former lover just minutes after she watched the prison lights flicker, signaling that the switch had been thrown for the electric chair. Reporters remembered that, as she was being led to the death chamber, that she had said days before that God had forgiven her and that she hoped the world would. A clever reporter from the New York Daily News smuggled a camera into the death chamber by strapping it to his ankle. He managed to click off a photo just as the current entered Ruth's body and snapped her body against the chair straps. The photograph ran in the next day's edition of the paper, but soon the lurid tale faded into history. Soon people remembered the photo more than they remembered who had been sitting in the chair. The dumbbell murder was another one for the history books. The town is Standard, a small Midwestern town where nothing ever happens. Quiet, peaceful, and tucked away among the cornfields and away from the dangers of the outside world. Unfortunately, there is nothing normal about Standard. There has been an evil that has been awakened, and now the residents are slowly going crazy. Men for no reason are coming home and murdering their families, and dark forms are appearing in people's mirrors. The evil is spreading, and now it's up to ex-Chicago cop Rob Aletto to find it. Time is running out, and the neighbors are becoming quiet shadows as they watch him. He doesn't have long before it'll start to get into his mind, and then he himself would be making that deadly trip home. 
Inside the Mirrors by Jason R. Davis, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample or purchase the title on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. When I was almost four years old, my mom invited my aunt and cousin over to our house. I was excited to see my cousin as I would have someone to play with. I didn't hear them arrive, but mom called out to let me know that my cousin was there. I left my bedroom at the end of the hallway and ran into the living room to see my mom, aunt, cousin, and several other people. My cousin and I quickly decided to go to my room, and on the way, she asked me who everyone else there was. I told her I didn't know. Eventually, we were bored, so we went back to our moms and I think it's weird that our moms were watching TV with all these other people around. I could hear them talking to each other but didn't catch or didn't understand what they were talking about. I could smell cigarettes, hear ice in glasses and a stereo or some music was on. Our moms, just wanting to talk and spend time with people their own age, told us that we could go jump on my parents' bed. Well, it's 1981 and that was one step below getting a pony. You didn't have to tell us twice. My cousin commented about the smell of smoke and all of the noise as we headed to the bedroom. Here's where I have to give you a little information on my parents' room. It had a master bath and a sliding glass door that led to a small sun porch. The sun porch had a screen door to the large backyard. So we're jumping and having a great time when I see what looks like a pair of huge eyes on the bottom right of the door. At the time, I thought they looked like Garfield, only not overlapping, and they were practically glowing. I pointed them out to my cousin, and as she was looking and about to dismiss it, they looked at her. We freaked out, and she decided we had to get our moms. I watched it as she leapt from the bed and they followed her movement, which made me getting off the bed even more terrifying. We ran out to the party and explained what we saw, but we were only told to go back and turn the light off. They insisted it was just a reflection. We go back down the hall, but don't want to go back to the room. Just as we try to turn back down the hall, a man in a dark suit walks out of my dark bedroom past us and my aunt yells at us to grow up and go back to jumping on the bed. We didn't like the idea but we really didn't want her to come down the hall angry either. So we begged for them to come look once more, but that just brought on the count you get as a warning that you are about to be in trouble. We look into the room, and the eyes are looking right at us. Our plan is to hit the lights and bolt for the bed no matter what. My cousin hit the switch. I instantly realized that you can't see the backyard. With the lights off, the bright orange street light lets you see not only the backyard but the houses behind it. The eyes were still there. Whatever it might be, it's blocking the entire door. We bolt for the bed and cover up under the blankets. That whole kid thing that nothing can get you under the blankets. Next thing I know, we've fallen asleep and we're being woken up by our moms. We try to point it out, but the eyes are gone and so are the people. My cousin says she doesn't remember, but that after we spoke about it up until she was about eight, when she said she didn't ever want to talk about it anymore, I think our very religious grandmother convinced her she would go to hell if she kept talking about it. The weirdest part of all of this is that over 30 years later, my mom remembers that night and wishes she had checked it out. I said something about her being too busy with the party. What party? she asked. I told her about all the people, the smoke, music, and wondering how they could hear the TV with so many people. She told me there weren't any other people there. I kept insisting my cousin and I had both seen the same thing, but she refused to talk about it ages ago. My mom has tons of questions, and I did my best to answer them, but she still maintains that no one else was there that night. I don't know what my cousin and I experienced. I don't know if it was something evil in the window and a haunting in the rest of the house or what, 
but I know I saw something. My mother knows we tried to get her attention. It was the weirdest thing I had ever seen. Traumatic events can sometimes trigger poltergeist activity, but for one young girl, the torment seemed to have no end. It's currently theorized that poltergeist activity arises out of the subconscious of a living person, called an agent. This agent, very often a young girl, usually is known to be under some kind of stress, whether it is emotional, physical, or psychological. By some mechanism that is still unknown to science and paranormal researchers, this inner stress can manifest as phenomena outside the agent. Turmoil inside the body and mind of the agent becomes a physical reality in the form of knocks on the walls, lights and other electronics flickering off and on by themselves, objects thrown about, and more. The case of Laura B. might very well qualify her as a poltergeist agent. As a young girl, she suffered the anguish of an alcoholic father who often lashed out in violent anger. It's not surprising, then, that Laura was terrified of her home's basement at night, since that is where her parents' bedroom was. The creepy feeling in my basement intensified as his alcoholism and addictions grew worse, Laura says, and I would refuse to go into my parents' room for any reason. There was always a negative feeling in the room, but I always attributed that to my dad. Evil in itself is not paranormal, and we can easily understand why Laura would get negative feelings from that room. About five years ago, however, her parents divorced, and that's when the line began to be crossed into the unexplained, when the poltergeist activity began. All of the negative feelings that had been in my parents' room suddenly moved into my room and intensified, Laura says. Now, on one level, this could be understood as a psychological reaction. Many children feel responsible or guilty for their parents' divorces, and Laura might have been transferring the negative feelings she once had about her parents' room, her father, and brought them into her own room, her unjustified guilt. But now that she was directing this fear and trauma inward, it began to manifest in outward phenomena. I had taken the TV from downstairs into my room but always had to sleep with it on or with me facing the other direction, Laura says in explaining how the phenomenon began. If I looked around my room at night, I would always see a tiny red orb zip across my room. I would watch it zoom from one side of my room to another, almost like the red dot from a laser pointer. Shortly after, I would see this red light. If I looked at my TV, there would be a small green square flashing at the center of the screen. This square would get larger with each flash and looked like it was an image, but I was way too scared to look at it. The flashing TV sent me extremely bad vibes and I would always turn out the lights or the TV afterward so I wouldn't be in the dark. Terrible, silent dark. If this happened just once, we might dismiss this experience as a hallucination, but the phenomenon repeated night after night for Laura. Each night, I would see the screen flash once and be too terrified to even consider looking at it. I realized that the red light was a sign that the TV would flash, so I would always turn on the TV or slam my eyes shut when I saw it. I got so scared of the red light and green flash that I stopped sleeping in my room altogether. Fast forward to a year after Laura's parents divorced. It was the end of the school year and Laura decided to have a sleepover party with a few close friends to celebrate. Laura planned for them to sleep in the living room, making the excuse that her bedroom was too small. I had other reasons for saying that, she says. One girl was intent on sneaking into Laura's room, however, and when she did so, Laura had a disturbing vision. What I saw made me go cold, she recalls, Black, smog-like gunk was oozing out from the crack under my door into the hallway. It was one of the most disgusting-looking things I have ever seen. Laura was at her wit's end. She asked another trusted friend who happened to have an interest in the paranormal to investigate her room. She went in and came out a while later looking white-faced. 
Whatever is in your room is the most evil thing I have ever encountered, she told Laura. It is not human. To be objective, we don't know whether or not Laura's friend is a suitable judge of such matters, but she did perhaps feel the same negativity that Laura was dealing with. Laura believes this was a turning point. After she investigated my room, it was as if hell had been unleashed, Laura says. I believe that acknowledging the entity for what it was gave it power. The negative feeling in my room spread to the entire house and made being there feel oppressive. I no longer felt safe in my house. It all seemed to come to a head one summer night when Laura and this friend were in the house alone. Even though it was the summer, my entire house was cold, she says. A heavy, malevolent feeling seemed to creep ever closer to us. We were cold, so we decided to make some soup. As we were in my kitchen, we heard a scratching noise come from the inside of the microwave. We opened it up to see where it could be coming from, and the noise stopped. We couldn't find the source, so we shut the door, and the scratching started up again. Laura's dog began to act strangely. He would stand, look nervously at the TV, whine with discomfort, then sit down again with his ears pinned back submissively. The two girls decided to put on a movie to calm their escalating fears. I was sitting on my couch with my feet tucked under me when I felt something cold, thick, and pointed brush from my heel to the arch of my foot, says Laura. It was very deliberate and the worst sensation I have ever felt. I screamed and jumped up, and my friend and I ran outside and got onto my trampoline and just held each other in the semi-darkness. I looked toward my room, and I could see a shape in my window, even though no one else was home. My dog started to freak out again, and there was a rustling noise in the grass. I saw what looked like a black cloak being dragged across the grass. The shape circled the trampoline several times and then disappeared. The disturbing activity continued for Laura until she got some advice from an online friend. He said he had two guardian spirits that he would send to me to take care of the creature, one light and one dark, Laura says. I was desperate for any kind of help, so I agreed. Most of us probably would not have taken that solution very seriously, but Laura insists that she witnessed a phenomenon that she interpreted as those two guardian spirits. That night, I stayed up all night watching three orbs of light fly frantically around my house, she says. One was an inky black color that seemed to ooze and drip. The others were a large black ball and a smaller white ball. The white and black ball were chasing and bumping into the inky blots as I watched wide-eyed. The black and white spirits forced it out of my house and for a while I thought everything would be all right. Things were not all right, however. Laura continued to be haunted by menacing shadows and experienced one particularly terrifying illusion. A couple of houses down the street, there's a family that has large Rottweilers, she says. One night I was walking home when I looked at that dog. It was staring at me with inky black eyes. It also looked like its jaw had been ripped off and its tongue was just lolling out of its mouth. I ran to my house and in front of my driveway was a cat with the same ripped-out jaw, but its eyes were normal. It was strange and disturbing, but luckily I only saw that phenomenon once. Today, the phenomena have subsided, but Laura admits that her faith has been shaken by this ordeal. I'm not sure what I believe anymore, she says, but all that I know for sure is that there is true evil in this world. Are you familiar with the concept of shrunken heads? You might think they're just stories from explorers about far-off tribes, plot devices from Gilligan's Island, or a scene from the horror comedy film Beetlejuice, but they're actually quite real. They might be small, but the practice of making shrunken heads has a big history. And that is the topic of this week's Mind of Marlar, which you can find right now by visiting mindofmarlar.com. I grew up in a small town in Illinois. When I was a teenager, 
I would spend most of my time with my best friend Haley. A lot of the time, we would hang out at her house, where just she and her mother lived. Sometimes her mother would tell us spooky stories about their old house, which would put us in the mood to go find a ghost of our own. Well, one night we decided to go out to Hungry Hollow Road. It's named after a legend we all knew in that area. The story goes, sometime during the Great Depression, a family with a bunch of little kids lived out there in a shack. There was a blizzard and they all got snowed in. The family ran out of food and slowly starved to death. Supposedly, if you drive out to said road, park, turn off your car engine and lights, you can talk to the dead children and they will answer. We headed out to the windy road, which is pretty much out in the country. Most of it just goes through different wooded areas and is pretty creepy at night. We found a good spot where we couldn't see any lights and parked the car. We rolled down all the windows. I sat in the back seat a little nervous by this point. Haley's mom was the one driving. She turned off the engine and lights. We sat in darkness and listened to the sounds of crickets and frogs. We heard some animals scurrying through the leaves, which made both Haley and I a little scared. We quietly talked amongst ourselves, daring each other to speak out loud to the children. I wouldn't. I was being a baby. There were some cookies left over in the car from earlier that day, so Haley decided to taunt the children. Hey, little children, are you hungry? I have some food here for you. She said it a few times. Then we sat there in silence for what probably seemed longer than it actually was before we heard a loud thump on the back of the car. Haley's mom turned the car on right away and we drove back to their house without looking back. Once we made it safely there, we got out of the car and went to inspect the back. We were wondering if there was damage since the noise was so loud. The back of the car had tiny little handprints. A possessed man has said he faced sheer terror after an evil demon took over control of his body. Gert Brower said he was left unable to breathe and a neighbor had to rescue him after the paranormal monster took control of him when he was 21 years old. He made the astonishing claim at the Paraforce UK Paranormal Convention in Witham, Essex. Mr. Brower, who was visiting from the Netherlands, told the stunned audience that in the year before his possession, a terrible series of events happened. He said, I had a car crash the same year, age 20. I lost my girlfriend in the same year, and a friend of mine was murdered. I thought, why am I getting so much bull in my life? He said he got himself a new apartment, but after just two months of being there, he saw a web coming down with a big spider in it. He said, I put the lights on, and there was nothing there. I came home two weeks later and could not breathe anymore. A neighbor was knocking on the door saying, Gert, Gert, Gert! She wanted to help me, but I couldn't breathe anymore. I had scratches. My brain was not working anymore and I couldn't breathe, so I went to see a shrink. Mr. Brower began writing two blogs, one called Me and the other He. He said, I was asked, why do you call it He? And I said I felt he was a demon. I hope no one here will get caught with something like that. Mr. Brower said after about two and a half months, he decided he could defeat the creature. He said, I changed my stance and had the psychology, I want to beat you, I want to win this battle. I needed to reschedule my thoughts because I was mixed up with a demon. He decided to train as an exorcist to be able to fend off the hellish spirit. He said he now knows just how rare demonic possession cases are. Mr. Brower, who was born in the Netherlands and now lives in Breda, said in 95% of possession cases, there is no demon involved, it's just the emotions of an entity. He told the convention he had paranormal experiences from as young as 11 when he also saw a psychiatrist. Mr. Brower said, aged 11, I would see things, pictures, and told my shrink what would happen in the future. 
He went on to found Paranormal Society World and GJB Media and describes himself as a demonologist, medium, and exorcist. The website of the Society says he has won 14 awards for his paranormal work and appeared on TV. His profile on the website states, from a young age, Gert could communicate with the immortal. He uses all his senses in the field. At his 21st year, he was confronted with a demon in his apartment. This was also his first negative experience in the paranormal. This made the road open for Gert as an exorcist and the occult. There's no scientific evidence that possession is real, but many religions carry out exorcisms to rid people of evil spirits. The oldest reference to demonic possession are from the Sumerians from around 4000 BC. They believed all diseases of body and mind were caused by sickness demons called Giddim. It was almost dark, and my mother and aunt were walking along the road on the side of the woods returning from their aunt's village where my grandmother had sent them to bring a bag of rice so she and her family wouldn't go hungry until her husband got paid for the job he had on the railroad. The twilight made it difficult to see, and they knew that soon it would be pitch black and they'd be unable to see anything at all. The woods were lonely, and a man could attack them at any moment. Even if they were to scream, no one would hear them. The woods were very thick with vegetation and frightening to walk through even in the daytime. Now that it was night, they could hear the crickets and smell the wetness of the dewy soil. They walked past a creek, joining with the crickets to make the sound of dark loneliness. Though they kept their ears open, ready to hear the footsteps of a mad attacker, all they could hear was the chirping of the crickets and the sound of the creek. My mother was cursing my grandmother for having sent her and her sister out so late, when suddenly my aunt grabbed my mother's arm and pointed to a young woman with long black hair in a torn blue sari and bare feet emerging from the woods. Both my mother and my aunt recognized her as the woman whose body had been found a year earlier on the side of the road. My grandmother had told them that she'd been raped and strangled probably as she'd been walking on the lonely road at night, just as my mother and aunt were doing now. She followed behind them as they walked. Though her mouth was gaping and she was pointing to it as if to show them a secret, she said nothing. My mother and aunt were terrified and walked as fast as they could, but the girl kept up with them. Then, as quickly as she had appeared, she slipped back into the woods and into the blackness of the night. Though they had heard stories about the reality of ghosts ever since they were little girls, my mother and aunt never believed them until now. They held tightly to each other as they walked, still listening for the footsteps of a man who could attack them and turn them into yet another silent ghost. Carlsbad Lagoon. Perfect for paddle and motorized water sports. It's one of the best places to enjoy wakeboarding and water skiing. Even if you're not into these activities, you can simply lay back and soak up some sun. Just make sure to pack more than sunscreen for protection. There are many things that go bump during both night and day, so you may want to be prepared before they make you their next victim. The water is so clear that you can almost see deep into the lagoon. As enchanting as this may sound, there is one big drawback to this. You will get to see her. Floating naked close to the surface, nothing about the siren hints to her ferocious nature except the blood around her mouth. Those who have the misfortune of seeing her are tricked into believing that she's a corpse the water around her looks a little bit murkier, but anyone who has seen her and survived to tell about it has had a difficult time explaining it. Locals have speculated that she actually bites her own lips to create the blood, adding to the illusion that she is injured and needs help. But if she can bleed, does that mean she's still alive? 
Perhaps that's the most chilling observation of them all. She lays in the water, waiting for somebody to come over to help her. Little do they know that this beautiful creature is just waiting to get closer to her latest victim to drag their lifeless bodies down with her. A local legend says that a young couple became her victims when the husband spotted her floating closer to the hull. Suspecting that she was one of the summer vacationers at the lagoon, he jumped into the water to save her. The minute he touched her, she opened her eyes and held on to him tightly. She bit at his throat and dragged him down with his blood swirling upwards. His wife, who was watching them from the hull, was hysterical when officials found their boat. Her husband's body is yet to be found. Not many people know that the land surrounding the lagoon used to be a cemetery. From 1885 to 1906, Oceanside's Buena Vista Cemetery was the resting place for many locals. Though many bodies were disinterred and moved over time, construction workers keep finding coffins and human remains regularly. Because the resting dead have awakened, the residents of Carlsbad are used to seeing ghostly apparitions in their backyards and near the lagoon. While most of these wander around, there are several who are out to get those who dare disturb their eternal sleep. Many of Carlsbad's residents have been found in the lagoon, drowned in its shallow waters. Considering how a few victims are good swimmers and their corpses showed no signs of resistance, it was only natural for the locals to blame the jittery, angry ghosts. Further confirming their suspicions are stories of a ghost who keeps on mumbling and calling residents' names. It makes its way easily to their homes, driving them crazy as it calls them out. The hills of northern Chile are not safe for men walking alone at night. A female spirit known as La Lola stalks the night, lost and enraged over the murder of her husband. But that's only where the story ends. It seems there was once a young woman named Dolores who was never at a loss for suitors as her father was extremely wealthy. She was beautiful and the man called her Lola. But her father was very protective and did his best to keep the men at bay. Only the perfect man would do for his beloved daughter. One day, Lola met a handsome young man and fell in love at first sight. But the man was a poor miner. Her father would never accept him. Blind with love, Lola ran away with the young man. They soon fell in with a group of his fellow miners and before long, the young man struck gold. Finally wealthy, they returned to Lola's father who, reluctantly, gave his blessing upon their marriage. Lola would soon discover, however, that though she loved him dearly, he did not return that love. The husband went out every night, carousing with friends and sleeping with other women. It happened so often that Lola was driven mad with jealousy and broken by her abused love. Late one night, her husband returned home to find Lola waiting on him. Before he could react, Lola had stabbed the man to death. In the act of murder, Lola's final tenuous ties to sanity were broken. She fled into the night, shrieking at the top of her lungs. Days later, Lola returned to her home, weeping and disheveled. In her madness, she no longer recognized the fact that she had killed her husband. Instead, she insisted that a man, jealous of their love, had killed her husband to claim Lola for himself. In the dead of night, Lola stole her husband's coffin and dragged it into the hills in search of the murderer. Unable to find the man responsible, Lola climbed higher and higher into the hills and mountains. When she finally died, she still had not managed to find the man responsible for her husband's death. And so, in death, she continues her search. Men in the mountains are said to hear their names called at night. If they follow the voice, they will find themselves face to face with Lola. She is beautiful, glowing in solid white with her husband's black coffin behind her. If he finds her, they say he will never be heard from again. 
killed by La Lola for murdering her husband. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. When I visited Lehigh, Oklahoma with my mom, dad, and sister, I was about 12 years old. What I remember about this desolate place is that the land is filled with chiggers. My legs had bites all over them. I remember seeing water snakes in these trippets made by coal miners. Strippets are large holes in the ground created by past coal miners. I remember capturing a land turtle, and after playing with this turtle for about two hours, I released it back in the grasslands. My dad was born and raised in Lehigh. His mother, Sophie Roberts, was known as the Angry Frenchwoman. My cousin, Paul Laird, at one time was the mayor of Lehigh, Oklahoma after his tour in Vietnam with the 1st Cavalry Division. When I visited Lehigh, it was during the weekend of the 4th of July, and I remember lighting a black cat firecracker and it blew up in my hand. I was screaming bloody murder. Believe me, it hurt. That very same night, after I fell asleep, I went sleepwalking in my grandmother's house, and my father found me walking about in a dead sleep. I believe the pain from the firecracker blowing up in my hand caused my sleepwalking. The next night, the pain subsided, and I was able to watch the fireflies in the night sky. My cousins and I would capture them and place them in a large jar. The very first time I went hunting was in Oklahoma, and I did not have the heart to shoot a rabbit nor could I shoot a deer. My dad sort of gave up on me when it came to hunting. Anyway, those are the things that I remember about Lehigh. Lehigh is a very old town, been around since 1882. At one time, this town was called Boone, but then they changed it to Lehigh, naming it after Lehigh County, Pennsylvania, a coal mining region. At one point in time, Pretty Boy Floyd passed through this town, and legend has it, hid at one of the homes in Lehigh. My grandmother lived in a home that was built by the blood money gained from a notorious sheriff of the town. Story has it the corrupt sheriff killed a resident and took his valuables and money. With that money, he built that house that my grandmother lived in. Lehigh once had a lynching there, conducted by the infamous Ku Klux Klan. Lehigh may be a small town, but it still has a historic past, and some of the past's history is tarnished. At one time, Lehigh was a thriving town because of the coal mines. Lehigh became a ghost town when the trains started using oil instead of coal. Many miners were injured, and some lost their lives in the coal mines. Some workers on the train tracks were also injured, and some lost their lives. There are people who have visited or lived in Lehigh that say that this town is very haunted the Owl Grocery Specter. Around this old building, a large, tall shadow is seen against the walls and on the ground. A few people have said that they have been pushed or shoved by this specter. Megan Hall, a visitor, says she was grabbed and then she felt like she was possessed. The possession lasted for about six minutes, and after the entity left her body, she vomited all over the place. Then there's the Strip at Hand Demon, Legend has it that back in the 1920s, two brothers were chopping wood. One brother told the other that if he placed his hand on a block of wood, he would chop it off. The brother did exactly that, and the brother chopped off his hand. After he chopped off his brother's hand, he felt so bad about doing it, he threw the hand into a strippet. 
by throwing the hand into a strip it. The brother thought he was hiding the evidence. Later, his brother died. In the strip it, people have claimed that they see a hand floating around in the water. The hand has all kinds of blisters on it, and one resident who does not want to be identified says that the hand once choked him. Many people believe that hand is demonically possessed. There's the coal miner in black. Residents have seen what appears to be a coal miner wandering around the thickets. He's dressed all in black. When one resident approached the miner, the miner said, Why? Why? Theory is that this is the ghost of a coal miner that lost his life in the mines. There's also the screaming blue lady. On one of the railroad tracks, late at night, people will see a woman dressed in blue and screaming at the top of her lungs. It's believed that she may have committed suicide at the railroad tracks. No one seems to know her story. Darren Danville from Texas says that his mother, a resident of Colgate, Oklahoma, believes that the screaming blue lady when she was alive found out that her husband was cheating on her with her best friend and that she ran onto the railroad tracks into an oncoming train and died. There's the flying bobcat. Hunters have seen what appears to be a bobcat that can leap from the tree and fly a considerable distance. The flying bobcat has been seen three times by hunters. And Lehigh Thunderbird. In 1987, a coal miner named Curly Bob made claim that he saw a large bird with a 30-foot wingspan fly over Lehigh. Could that be some type of Thunderbird? Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. Love and the Electric Chair was written by Troy Taylor. The abduction of Linda Cortile is by Les Hewitt for Paranorms.com. Her feet were swinging is from YourGhostStories.com. The Drish Hauntings was written by Elizabeth Tilstra for TheLineup.com. The Darkness of DeForest Park is from Backpackerverse. The Haunted Farmstead is from GhostsInGhouls.com. The Shadow Killers of Jamaica comes from MessageToEagle.com. The Woman in the Blue Sari was written by Amardeep Singh for MyHauntedLife2.com. I Was Possessed by a Demon was written by John Austin for Express.co.uk. The Ghostly Kids of Hungry Hollow Road was submitted anonymously to Weird Darkness. Carlsbad Lagoon's Sinister Siren is from Backpackerverse. The Haunting of Laura is from Thoughtco.com. La Lola, the Vengeful Female Spirit in Northern Chile is from ParanormalInvestigating.com. My First Spooky Experience was submitted anonymously to Weird Darkness. And Haunted Lehigh, Oklahoma was written by Paul Dale Roberts, submitted by MyHauntedLife2.com. Again, you can find links to all of these stories in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 16, verse 9. In his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. In a final thought, one of the hardest life lessons is letting go. Change isn't easy, but it's better than being stuck. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.